Hello, aspirants. Looking at current affairs for 17th March, the news items that we have picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 10. We'll look at them in detail. The first one, health spending to be 2.5% of GDP. So this is the draft national health policy 2017, which has now finally been cleared by the central government. So this assures that health spending would be increased to 2.5% of GDP in a time bound manner. And it ensures health care services to Indian citizens. But the critics say that it stops short of making health a right. So guaranteed health care is not what as expected because there are rights as such provided like you have a right to employment under NREGA National Rural Employment Guarantee Act so that is a legislation providing right to employment so similarly right to health actually has not been specifically provided through this policy which was actually part in the draft so draft had it but this policy finalized does not include that so that's why critics say that whatever provisions it is making it becomes it does not have any weight because there is no assurance. So these are empty assurances because there is no guarantee. You cannot have any assurance based approach without it being having any legal consequences. So if it is not provided, if there is a legal consequence, then there is some assurance. Otherwise, it is hollow. So that is what the critics are saying about it. But then it is just a policy. So from that perspective, actually it is trying to bring in wellness rather than just concentrating on sick care. means prevention. So that's what it is emphasizing on prevention, health promotion. It also seeks to purchase strategically from this private sector. So the private sector strengths will also be incorporated to achieve national health goals. The goals which it has put forth are here shown. So you can see it targets to reduce under 5 mortality rate means children under 5 reaching up, up uh, not reaching up to 5 years of age and dying. So those under 5 mortality rate has to be reduced to 23 annually by 2025 then mmr maternal mortality rate to be reduced to 100 means mother's death as such during you know, delivery as such then infant mortality rate so infant mortality rate is to be reduced to 28 by 2019 so there are different years targets provided you don't have to remember these targets and the years in which they have to be achieved upsc will not ask you a question on this but understand what is under 5 mortality rate and what is infant mortality rate. So infant mortality rate means children dying before reaching the first one completing one's first birthday. Means under 1 years of age. So this is under 5. Infant means under 1. Neonatal mortality rate. So this neonatal means children dying before uh, completing 28 days. 28 days. Within 28 days after birth, the child dies. That is called neonatal mortality. And stillbirth rate. Stillbirth rate has to be brought to single digit by 2025. Stillbirth means a child born dead. So that is stillbirth rate. Then you can see other focus areas clarified here. So promote research on tribal medicine is also there under this health care policy. Then a public health care management cadre will be established in each state. Public hospitals should provide universal access to drugs and diagnostics. This to be ensured. So these are the targets, focus areas. Regulate the use of medical devices for quality compliance. And then it also seeks to increase life expectancy to 70 years. Presently, it is 67.5 years. So there are also tribunals for grievance redressal is also proposed to be set up. So that is regarding the national health policy. The next news item is GST laws ready for assemblies parliament. So this is regarding the GST laws approved by the GST Council. So they have presently approved ceiling for CES. So apart from the tax slabs for GST, there is a CES additional tax which would be applicable on the topmost, the highest slab. So this CES we have already discussed. This is to ensure that the compensation which central has ensured to the states can be provided for through this CES. So the maximum CES which can be applied, a ceiling of 15% has been approved for drinks and luxury cars. So for uh, you, you can see those so for drinks and luxury cars, it is 15% for other commodities like for uh, tobacco products. Actually, it is much higher and for environment says for coal, lignite and peat also it has been capped at rupees 400 per ton. So that has been decided. It has been given forth here. You can see so. BDs have been exempted presently from CES. For pan masala, it is 135% actually. For mineral aerated water, 15%. So drinks as such, so sweetened drinks, 
then motor cars and vehicles you can see 15 percent with exception of motor vehicles for transportation of 10 or more people so if it's taking a larger number of people there's an exemption and it's not just for the luxury cars that is the tobacco products also it is 290 percent as such and clean energy cess you can see that is on coal so that is 400 percent so this is the cess capped as such approved by the gst council so this cess would be applicable on demerit of sin goods you can see on top of the maximum GST rate. So demerits in goods are actually in the topmost slab. So you can see top, the slabs which have been approved. So for some commodities would not be taxed, zero rated under the GST, means they will not be taxed at all. So these are many goods like food grains, etc. So no taxation on them. Then 5% is the first slab. So these are goods of mass consumption like spices, mustard oil. 12% is generally for processed food. So these are examples given. So there are many more commodities which have to be finalized in this category. So 0%, 5%, 12%. Next is 18% for other commodities. Then 28% for white goods and cars. White goods we have discussed earlier too. White goods are goods like uh, electronic appliances actually like uh, which are generally white in color like washing machines etc. So those are called white goods and cars. And then luxury cars will have a cess also on top of it. Pan masala, tobacco, aerated drinks. So that cess limit has been finalized now. Means on top of this 28% assess. So that is the news presently. It's called four slabs. I means zero, zero is not any slab. These are excluded from GST. 5, 12, 18, 20. These are the four tax slabs. And this is regarding the GST council just for revision. So it comprises of the chairman and ministers or finance ministers of all states. So each state nominates a minister here they have two-third voting power all the states together and central government has one-third voting power so there may be a minister of state for finance also representative here and decisions have to be taken by a majority which is of three-fourth members so if anything is approved by three-fourth members of the council it can be passed and quorum means minimum number of members who should be present for the council session council proceedings to take place is 50 percent so at least 50% members should be there and this is the majority by which decisions would be taken. Many decisions presently have been taken by consensus also. So this also we have discussed. And about demerit goods, sin goods, what does this term also mean? On which success has been applied is those which have a huge social cost. So these are called demerit goods. So you can see examples like drugs, cigarettes, alcohol, fast food. So even if they are permitted, Drugs may not be permitted to. Others which are permitted, on they are made costly by taxation so that their consumption can be reduced. That way. Or at least consumption can be punished. So, sin goods or demerit goods. Then, the next news item is, industries get six months for retrospective green nod. So, the Environment Ministry now has come up with a plan to have a six-month window given. So, this it says is a one-time opportunity to all industrial projects which are functioning without environmental clearance. So, environmental clearance is a prerequisite. It should be there before industrial projects are put into effect. So, that approval is required, EC is required, but then that has not been done by many industrial projects which are functioning. So, that is why it says this is a one-time opportunity. So, they can apply for this EIA, Environment Impact Assessments, Environmental Clearance, backdated. Means now, right now, you can have that approval got. So, this window has been provided. The government is justifying that this is not the first time this has been done. It has been done earlier too in 2012 and 2013. Even then, High Court of Jharkhand had passed an order declaring some of the provisions then as void, null and void. So, that was there. And NGT has also said that Environment Impact Assessment Notification of 2006 provides for prior environmental clearance. So, there is no procedure that post-environmental clearance can be provided for. So, this present Ministry of Environment's order now makes this possible. So, that is the reason it says that they could not be allowed to continue pollution unregulated. So, they should not be shut down, but they should be provided clearance. So, that's what it's, the ministry is trying to justify it as. And it is saying that we are putting all these under the category grade A. Means, highest, highest level of scrutiny will now be required for all these projects, which take this one-time opportunity to apply for green certificate. So, this environment impact assessment has been introduced in India in the late 1970s. Then, in 1994, a notification also came for this, which made 
necessary for projects and processes to get environmental clearance. And the 2006 notification provides for a transparent, decentralized and efficient regulatory mechanism. So these are the provisions it calls for. It says that environmental safeguards have to be incorporated by a project at planning stage. Also, the stakeholders should be involved in a public consultation process. So people who are project affected people as we call them. So before the project is put into effect, at that time only environmental impact assessment is done before before putting it into effect. So this public consultation is required under this notification, it's mandated. Then it says identify developmental projects based on impact potential instead of investment criteria. So developmental projects are endorsed based on the investment which they are making. That should not be the case, but rather what is the impact potential? How negative the impact would be? That also has to be taken into consideration before you know, identifying developmental projects. And finally, it categorizes projects into A and B categories. So what we saw is that grade A would be where all these projects will be put presently, which use this one time window. So this A and B category is based on impact potential, means very high impact potential, then more scrutiny required, highest level of scrutiny required. And B category would be lower level of scrutiny. So this is regarding EIA. The next news item is CAC pulls up IT department on shell companies. So this is regarding the shell companies. We have already discussed this earlier too. A shell means only an outer covering, means a company which does not actually have any substance, any major investment and activity going on, but it is just shown on paper to evade taxes. So those are called shell companies. So there are such such shell company suspicious dealers who have come out to the fore and these have been highlighted by the Maharashtra sales tax department. So these findings have not been scrutinized by the income tax department and that is why CAG is now questioning this. So this is regarding actually Hawala dealers. So these are Hawala operators. You can see this was the provision that Hawala operators involving around 39,488 beneficiary dealers had passed on an input tax credit of around 1,333 crore in three years. So this is from 2008-9, this data had come forth. So in this, what happened is Hawala. Hawala actually means that transactions being done through these Hawala operators. And generally, they are foreign currency related transactions or interest interstate or inter-country transaction. So what happens is a transaction is being done, means payment is being done by a Hawala and he is assured. So this is a system based on a trust and assurance that he would get back that payment later. So such Hawala operators have demanded tax credit and they have got it too. But the declarations, the tax invoices which they have provided are actually fake. So there are no actual transactions which have taken place. They have done these payments also have been done against the invoices bills which have been there by checks or bank transfers but then actually later these amounts were paid back to the Hawala operators. So such transactions have been done just to get input tax credit and this was highlighted by the state department of Maharashtra sales tax department but then income tax department has not scrutinized. That's what it's saying. They did not even scrutinize all the assets featuring on the list. So this lacune has been highlighted by CAG in its report now. So you can see shell companies are used to generate bogus bills and they inflate the expenses on various counts. So they just show expenses to get tax credit. So that is, here. they are saying that it's using the banking channel to make it look genuine. But then the ultimate beneficiaries, they are actually Hawala operators who are facilitating this, they are taking a commission there. So this CAG reports, actually the response of the finance ministry on this was that there is, this has not resulted any loss of revenue because if it is a bogus purchase shown, then it's a bogus sales also. So there's nothing gone, nothing come. So there is no revenue to be demanded. So there's no loss of revenue because CAG generally brings up this, that because of these lacunae, there is a loss of revenue estimated by CAG. So that like that, we have seen many cases, like in coal scam also, we saw that the CAG said, that since coal was not auctioned as such, it has resulted in that much loss to the exchequer. So it goes in crores of rupees. It was 1.86 lakh crore, which CAG said resulted in, uh, this is the revenue loss which resulted because of coal block allocation not done by auctioning. So auctioning means bidding being done. So that was not done and allocation was done without bidding. That's why this was an estimated loss because we could have earned revenue, but we did not. So similarly here also when these transactions 
are not seen to be genuine and not investigated on, then it is a loss to the exchequer. Tax revenue is not coming in. So that is why finance ministry is justifying here by making such statement, which actually does not have any standing because if there are bogus transactions done and then tax is being saved, means there is money here. So money, what is the source of that money? The true source has also has to be known. So that is there. So this you can see, Hawala. Then, so this is a form of banking. You can see money transfer is done. So it's quick, safe, and secure. No paper trails, no taxation, no taxation also can be brought in here because there's no paper trail as such kept also. So this is generally used by criminals who are indulging in wrong activities to avoid tracking of the money. So that is there. Then this is regarding the present CAG report on this Maharashtra Sales Tax Department's details. So these details of these had been sought from the IT department and did not give it to CAG for long. So finally now it has come up with this in the report. Then this is regarding a shell company. A company which has just been set up, which has no significant assets, no operation as such. It exists only on paper. No true physical presence, little economic value. So such shell companies are set up only to evade taxes. Then the next news item is Indian commissioners to meet in Lahore this week. So this is regarding India's Indus commissioners. So Indus commissioner for India and Pakistan. Both these will be meeting on Indus water treaty. So this Indus water treaty makes provisions for this. And the first time this meeting would take place after the UE terror attacks. Because after that India has announced that it will relook into the Indus water treaty. So it was one threaten which was given actually nothing was done as such because Indus Water Treaty is said to be one of the very successful treaties. So it is by arbitration from the World Bank that this treaty has come into effect. So here India and Pakistan you can see 1960 the provisions have been made. We have discussed this quite often. If you want to go through it once again you can. So the three rivers Indus, Jhelum, Chenab are with Pakistan. Ravi Bias Satleja with India means major usage can be by these countries. And on the other rivers, two provisions are there. Run of the river projects can be allowed. So there are norms which have to be satisfied. And the, under the treaty, they meet at, at least once a year. So this meeting of in commissioners takes place once a year to discuss all the bilateral problems. Now, now after two terror attacks, this meeting is going to take place. That is the significance of this news. Then the next news item is U.S. lawmakers back green cards for STEM graduates. So STEM means science, technology, engineering and mathematics. So STEM graduates who are coming to U.S. should be backed and they should be provided green cards. This is what the U.S. senators from the Republican Party are saying. Because presently the way we are seeing the visa norms are being changed. The H-1B visa norms. So H-1B visa is easier to get rather than the green card. So green card is permanent residency. And then after that, five years completion and so there are norms. After that, you can get citizenship of America, USA. So this is the way. So H-1B visas, for that we are seeing presently US has made norms stringent. So th this process is presently going to start off too. So H-1B visas are provided to at least at to these 85,000 beneficiaries. So there are three times the number who are applying and only 85,000 are actually given H-1B visa. So this is done through a lottery system. So this is by lottery, anyone picked up. So now it may be possible that the system may also change because H-1B visa should be given at least to these 10 graduates. So that is the proposal that they should be given even staple green cards rather. So that is a step ahead. So at least in H-1B visa, we may expect a change also. Looking at Donald Trump's policy that immigration should be merit-based. So immigration merit-based means only those who deserve should come up and be given H-1B visa. So that is there. And even in students, the students in USA, the number of Indian students are second only to China. And amongst the Indian students, 80% of these students are STEM students. So if this provision is put into effect, STEM graduates will be given any facilities, then it would benefit Indians also. So that is H-1B visa, non-immigrant visa, allows US companies to employ foreign workers. So you can allow, be allow you are allowed to work in USA with US companies. So that is there. So it is easier to get rather than the green card. That's why this is popular amongst companies. Then the next news item is 
US trade nominee for aggressive steps on IP, intellectual property. So US trade representative has been finalized. So he would be sworn in soon. So here he has said that we will have aggressive measures put in to protect intellectual property rights in India. So there are concerns. India is already for years now in the priority watch list of USTR, US trade representative annual report. So means for for USA, India is on a priority watch list because it does not adhere to intellectual property rights norms. So this USA keeps on saying that the US, that Indian Patents Act is not WTO compliant while India keeps on asserting that it is. And especially controversial is Section 3D of India's Patent Act. Means there is nothing wrong with that, but USA does not approve of it. It says that this is not WTO compliant. So this actually prevents pharmaceutical companies from continuously extending their patents. So this provision is there to ensure that evergreening of patents does not take place. Means patents again and again provided for. So a molecule or something has been developed and now it has been given a patent. After the patent has been expired, so you know, while the patent has been expired, now the company will make some changes and come up with a new version of it and then say this has to be give provided patent first and again patent would be provided so that is called evergreening means patent will have a long like keep on living so that should be avoided that's why section 3d is there this says that this is the provision here it's mentioned the mere discovery of a new form of a known substance which does not result in increased efficacy of that substance or the mere discovery of any new property or new use of a known substance or of the mere use of a known process, machine or apparatus. Unless such process results in a new product or employs at least one new reactant, it cannot be given intellectual property patent. So that is the provision here. So no increased efficiency, no patent. Even if that's a new form of the same substance. It's an already known substance. No betterment is there. So that's what it says. So this is section 3D. And another provision with which USA has a problem is the compulsory licensing norms which are used. So compulsory licensing is also WTO compliant. There are provisions in the WTO Act that is strips trade related intellectual property rights. Act. So that is already there. But still USA keeps on having problems because American companies are here. They are suffering because so with compulsory license, the government provides another generic drug manufacturer to manufacture a patented drug. So the first example of this also being done. This is WTO compliant, RIPS compliant. And this first example in India was of 2012, this Bayer drug, Nexavar, which was patented. Bayer had its patent. Patent was alive. Still, NATCO, a generic drug manufacturer was given the license by the government to manufacture a generic version of this drug. So this is generally done when the prices of drugs are too high, it becomes inaccessible. So in such cases, government has this avenue. It can provide compulsory license for generic drugs manufactured for that. So this was put into effect in this case. Then the next news item is startup firms may soon find it easy to wind up. So this is a proposal coming from Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion. So under the Ministry of Industries, this proposal has come means the startups have to be notified as fast track firms. Means if they are notified as fast track firms, then they can wind up within 90 days. So that is the benefit of this tag that a fast track firm means they can be wound up early. So this has to be done by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs because that is the authority which gives, makes provision for this. So Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion is writing to Ministry of Corporate Affairs to make provision for this. So that startups are favored because startups being wound up easily is also one incentive. So Startup India initiative has already been launched. It's been more than a year now. Startup India, Stand Up India. So that, under that also DIPP is the nodal agency of the central government. So presently also a report had also come which endorsed that startups should be able to wind up easily the way it is an international norm too in many countries. So the Startup India plan, uh, action plan also which was there has been given in short here. So you can see it, it had provided for a corpus means around 10,000 crore fund was set up to support startups. So 80% reduction in patent registration fee would be there for startups, any patent which they register for. A group of lawyers were established to help resolve any patent related problem for free for them. 
for startups the definition of startups was also there which we'll discuss that also and prominently actually startup india provided for tax exemption startups would be exempted from tax for 3 years also self certification would be sufficient for labor and environment related laws so that is the easy startup registration and also startups should be able to wind up in 90 days was also there 90 days window for startups to close business this was also there so this is the the provisions major provisions you can see for startups to facilitate them under startup india stand up india program and what is a startup the startup there are three specific definitions a few days ago we have done an article on this also in news we have discussed that startups have to be redefined now because startups have to be not more than 5 years old means they should be as have been registered before 5 years at least two, less, means there should be less than 5 years so there are these demands coming forth from startup industry that many startups in the uh, medical sector so there it that requires biomedical etc it requires some time to establish base so these startups may be more than 5 years of age then they would be excluded from this scheme and the benefits which are there here so they were demanding that this should change also they were demanding that this annual turnover requirement which is there so this criteria is there that the annual turnover should also be not high means the startups just established not having much turnover so here also annual turnover of 25 crores not exceeding 25 crores in any preceding financial year is also a criteria to be defined or identified as a startup so here also they were demanding that this also may be not be the case for many startups which are having to put huge expenditure also in various equipments etc so that is why these changes were also demanded nothing has been done as of now but this is there first criteria on age second on annual turnover and third is on it should it's a startup means it is setting up it is uh, doing something new so there is some new product process or uh, driven by technology or intellectual property which it is initiating so that is the first and foremost criteria for startups that it it is anything innovative so it's making some innovative initiative so these are the three and it should be a private limited partnership form so that is there since one years for startups also how many have been chosen for startup india initiative has been listed here 522 startups have been chosen in one year this is jan 2017 data actually and companies which sought certification as startups were 1425 so there have not been many startups also identified under this scheme then the next news item is new zealand river gets legal status as a person so this is river wanganui this is revered by this tribe maori tribe in new zealand so new zealand a neighbor of australia here it's the third longest river in australia, new zealand and it has been given this status by the parliament there so a law has been passed it's a legal person means it can be represented in legal proceedings so this is the first time in, in the world that a river has been given the status of a person a legal entity and the last news item is uk grants doctors first license to create three parent babies so these three parent babies means three people are involved means there is a couple male and female you can see so this is the couple patient couple so here the egg and the sperm egg from the female and the sperm from the male is taken so actually this mitochondria abnormality is generally seen in females and then this is genetically inherited so what happens is when the female is suffering from this then the patient's egg cells which have been donated to the egg also will have this abnormal mitochondria so what is done in this case is a donor is formed so this donor has her egg donated and this has a healthy mitochondria and fertilization is done for both so means is this is the sperm so fertilization for both is done of course in vitro fertilization in the lab and then the dna of this donor's egg is removed so mitochondria is there and egg is don't dna is removed means no genetic material of this will be there and this dna of this mother's egg removed from here is placed in this healthy mitochondrial egg and then this is put in inserted into the womb and pregnancy takes place and the child is born so this ensures that is abnormal mitochondria is not inherited and the diseases caused due to these fatal diseases are not been suffered by by the child so you can see if it is faulty it can cause fatal heart problems liver failure brain disorders blindness even muscular dystrophy so muscular dystrophy means muscle development is affected too. it's not there so these are the problems because of the mitochondrial defects 
so these mitochondrial diseases can be which are incurable also cannot can be ensured that they don't pass down the maternal line now so this has already been done this technique is called mitochondrial pronuclear transfer technique so this has been a technique which has been used for the first time in the world and so far it has been used once in 2016 by us doctors in mexico so again not allowed in the country so in mexico they, they did this on a jordanian couple and now uk's fertility regulator has allowed england's doctors to have this technique put into effect so that is regarding this so in vitro fertilization in vitro means in the lab so female eggs and male sperms are fertilized in the lab and then it is the embryo is placed in the female's womb and pregnancy is effect, effected and this is regarding mitochondria we discussed this a few days ago to the power house of the cell each cell has mitochondria so this mitochondria is where the atp adenosine triphosphate the units of energy are also produced here so this is called the power house this provides energy so this mitochondrial defects result in diseases and they can be avoided in in childbirth if this technique of pronuclear transfer is used so these are the news items thank you